seated to my far left at this table, first of all, is Robert Snow. He is our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Next to him is Carolyn Taylor, the School Committee Representative from Ward 6. Then we have Dennis Sullivan, the School Committee Member from Ward 1. Teresa Cardoso, School Committee Member from Ward 2. Charlene Harris from Ward 4. Mary Jo Rossetti from Ward 7. Kate Murray, by the way, and Mary Jo Rossetti is the current chairperson of the school committee. Then we have Kate Murray from Ward 5, and she is currently the vice chairperson of the school committee. I'm Roberta Bauer. I represent Ward 3, and I am chairing this subcommittee, which is educational programs. To my right is our wonderful secretary for the school department and to the superintendent of schools who takes wonderful notes and we couldn't do this all without her. And of course, on my far right is Dr. Albert Argenziano, our superintendent of schools. I'd like to invite Irini Dos Santos back up to the microphone so that she can begin the presentations. Welcome, you all. We are glad to have you all over here, teachers, and specifically the parents. We, as a parent coordinator, we thank you all for your support for everything you have done to us as a professional of the Summerville Public Schools and also as a communi community. I really appreciate everything you have done and I want to let you know, the school committee member, that we are here to express to you our feelings. As a parent coordinator, I'm only going to tell you what parents tell, tell, usually to tell us asking about what's going to happen to bilingual program. I have no question. I have no answer, I mean. I have a lot of, we do have a lot of questions, I'm sorry. But we don't have answer. And we are here to let you know that we are afraid. We are concerned about the bilingual program. Our children need do, that program. And the, if Somerville approved already the bilingual program, once we approved, because we want it, because it works for us. Maybe it doesn't work for another cities, but for us it's already expressed that it's good program. And by the number of students, it says by itself, right? And that's why we are here to let you know we are afraid, we are worried, we are concerned about that, and we need your support. <laughs> Thank you. I want to let you know that our children, future, are in your hand. It's in your hand. Our children, future, it's in your hand. Dr. Argenziano, the school committee members, the mayor, because as a parent coordinator, I cannot do anything. And also, I'm, I'm a parent. As a parent, I understand very well because how glad I am to have my daughter in the bilingual program. She eats already, she, she left already the bilingual program and she speaks two language because the, that program. As a personal, as a parent, that's my testimony because Mariana dos Santos passed to the Lincoln Park. I have over here who teacher Mariana and I really appreciate that. She speaks fluently to two language, languages. She reads, she writes two languages. She expressed herself very well in both, in both languages. And we know the world needs to speak more than one language. And I don't understand why the United States needs to retrocede. I really don't understand because the whole Europe is speaking more than two languages. If you go to Europe, you're going to see that. The whole world, what's happened to the United States? I, I really want to understand that as an immigrant. I know how important it is to have, to, to, to speak two or more languages. As a professional, as a person, in all areas of the life, we need that. And once, once again, I want to let you know, all parents, 
You can see over here tonight, they are looking for the same answer. What's going to happen to all kids? Probably, probably, people who voted against the bilingual program do not know the bilingual program dynamic. They don't know at all the need of being bilingual or trilingual, how many languages are possible. We are the, on the, in the first world, uh, in the first country of the world. The first country of the world, what's happened to the, this country? This country, it's, it's, it's walking back. We cannot accept that. We need your support. Because only our kids are gonna be, gonna make the difference tomorrow. And today we need you. And God bless you all. Thank you. I think that those of you who have been following the progress of the UNS Amendment and the school committee for the past, seems like over a year now, know that the Somerville School Committee was the first school committee to come out publicly against the UNS referendum. We took a formal vote on that. We have continued to oppose the UNS referendum, although I think saying that now I could probably be sued. Um, and we all know that the, Somerville voted against curtailing bilingual education as we know it. So I know that that referendum did pass and that we are all concerned about what that means for us now. And at this time, I'd like to have Dr. Argenziano speak a little bit about some of the things that are in progress in terms of implementation or um, ways that maybe that we can try to continue our bilingual program as we have in the past. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And uh, welcome, everyone, and it's a pleasure to see parents and staff here this evening. Uh, I, I think really there are three issues. In only three issues. Uh, the first issue is the two-way program that we've had numerous discussions and conversations over. The two-way program, uh, to my understanding, uh, as of Monday morning, uh, and you have to understand things are changing every 24 hours, but as of Monday morning, uh, the Department of Education told us that kindergarten through grade two would be relaxed in grades three on would be where they would begin focusing on one year where uh, English language learners would have one year basically to learn the language of English. So if you follow me that, the two-way people in the audience, if you can just follow me for a minute, let's assume we're going to change the name and keep the program called UNIDOS. If, in fact, we have one year, yet they relax kindergarten one and two, I have an extreme comfort level that the students presently in Unidos going into grade three are bilingual. And I don't think there's anyone in the audience who would disagree. And I also have a comfort level because my four sons spent 10 years in an immersion program, and I have proposed on two occasions to this school committee uh, that we begin an immersion program in Japanese, Chinese, and other languages because I agree with Mrs. Dos Santos that in today's society, one language will never get by. So on the two-way, I feel very comfortable that next Saturday, parents can register for kindergarten and whether they're English speakers or Spanish speakers, 
That program will continue under the title of UNIDOS as of January 15th. The second issue that a number of people are here, and I met with the whole bilingual staff uh, just before we broke for the holidays. As of this morning, in my meeting with the mayor, uh, we need to cut for April 1, and we need to cut about 10% for July 1. So if the city of Somerville needs to cut 10% from a $165 million budget, of which the Somerville Public Schools is 50.5, that means the city of Somerville, as of today, the Somerville Public Schools needs to cut a minimum of $5 million, a minimum as of today. So if we were going to cut $5 million and 83% of our budget is staff, this is what I told the bilingual staff, so any bilingual staff member who's in the audience, I said to them, as I'm going to say to everybody in here, you can assume if the bilingual staff was in the center, the regular ed staff was to the left, and the special ed staff was to the right, that if we had to cut 10%, then 10% of the people sitting in the center and to the left and to the right, and because we have a strong teachers union, it would be last one in, first one to go. And I referred back to 1981 because I probably at that time was the oldest person in the room and remembered 1981 that all of our 25 to 35 year olders were laid off. And that's why cities and towns like some of them, we're not unique. We have a staff between 50 and 60 and a staff between 25 and 35. In the 45, 40 to 50 range, They all took other careers and other jobs, and at that time, the software and technology industry was just beginning. So a number of people went into that field. Today, other than health careers, it's pretty limited for jobs. So if 83% of our budget is salaries, you can count on a minimum of 15 less bilingual teachers, a minimum of 15 to 20 less regular education teachers, a minimum of 15 less SPED teachers, complete wipeout of paraprofessionals. Now this is just, this is indefinite, but this is what 10% means to me that I would present to the school committee who makes the final fiscal decision. But if 83% of your budget is people and you have to cut five million dollars, it has to affect people. So you don't want anyone to lose their job. And for the governor to ask us to cut five to 10% right now, for me to lay someone off now, they just go out the door and collect unemployment, so I haven't saved anything. So April, May, and June, it's, literally foolish to lay anyone off because you would just be paying unemployment costs and health benefits. So for the bilingual staff who are sitting here and for the parents that you've talked to them, what I'm saying I told all of them at the Healy School cafeteria on a Monday uh, in December. I met with the whole staff and I've met with uh, the union leadership and we're trying to get a severance package that if we can get 50 to 60 teachers to take advantage of that, we could save an awful lot of our young people and have people who are 55, 56, 57 sever with the school district and retire two or three years early so that we can keep our younger generation and, and our future. So that's the second issue. And the third issue is, is the big issue that most people are here about. And uh, I, I may turn the mic at some point uh, over to Bob Snow, our assistant superintendent, if he, he wants to share, but this is our understanding as of today. We have seven months to implement 
question number two, which is now law. Your bilingual education that was voted in 1971 that we all felt comfortable with for 31 years is gone. It's gone. The urban superintendents, there are 22 of us, we have put together a letter that all of the legislators, the governors, school committee members will be receiving in, in probably by Friday or Monday the latest. We have asked all 22 of us because the 22 urban superintendents, we have 80% of the second language speakers in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. There are 351 cities and towns, 22 of us, 22 cities have 80% of the second language population. I said this to the school committee and some of them didn't like it. But why would 330 cities and towns who have no bilingual population not vote for the referendum? Of course they're gonna vote for the referendum. Why should they spend more tax dollars for 22 cities and towns? They're not gonna help us. And that's why it overwhelmingly passed. So we have seven months to implement that law. What the urban superintendents have asked for is a three year grace period to implement it to allow us to do professional development with our staff because a child coming from Brazil or Haiti or Guatemala who is 10 years old in the fourth grade reading at a first grade level in his own language and he walks into Somerville Public Schools September 1st, 2003, we basically have 180 days to totally immerse that child in English so that he's completely bilingual. Now, I would take any one of our teachers in the audience and tell you they could do that if they had no other children in the room. If I had that child one-on-one, -on -one, and, and let me tell you an experience. My four sons, when we moved to Mexico, to run 16 American schools in Mexico, from 7.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., they studied in English as if that school was in San Diego, Boston, or New York. After lunch at 12.30, because we were in a foreign country, they were required to study in Spanish, English, history, math, and science. They had six months, one-on-one, -on -one, to be immersed in Spanish enough to study, write, read. And my youngest was in the second grade. I had a second grader, a third grader, a seventh grader, and an eighth grader at the time. And they called me many things for doing that to them. I went through many a tearful evening of my second grader trying to write something in another language because it would be like if I went out into the audience and I said, furful rapo dibble. That's what that child hears in English. He just got here from Portugal, from Brazil. That's what he hears. Furful dibble. That's what he hears. That's exactly what he hears. And one-on-one, -on -one, any teacher sitting in this room within seven months can have that child ready to study in English. But when you add into a regular classroom 16, 17, 18, 19 other children, it's not gonna be easy. What the urban superintendents have asked to do is we will accept the referendum because we don't have a choice. We're asking for a three year, give us through 2005, 2006, the opportunity to professionally develop and train our staff as English immersion teachers, number one, and added to that, which is extremely difficult with the budget cuts, be able to purchase the materials necessary to do this in 180 days. So the 22 urban superintendents, and it's under Carla Bears letterhead, who's the superintendent of Lowell, and we, were, we have all co-signed the letter, and tomorrow in Marlboro is exactly when we're signing it, uh, 
and then that will be distributed Friday and the latest people will get it. And that's what we're asking the governor, the lieutenant governor, the legislators, anyone who can potentially help us will receive that letter. So if nothing changes, worst case scenario, we have seven months beginning in September to get all of our children immersed. And if, if the two-way is a great program because you start in K and you'll have the luxury of keeping the students. If you have a child that enters your system in K, by grade one or two, you've done a pretty good job. But it's the child that enters a school when he's 10, 11, and 12, and he's two to three reading levels behind in his own language. Now, I was using that as an example. I'm saying the most difficult child to teach is when they come in when they're 10, 11, 12 years old, even at the high school level. It's, it's, no, I'm using that as an example that that's extremely harder to do. The research that I'm comfortable with is immersion works if you have the child in a small setting, three on one, two on one, one on one, even maybe five to one, and you have the opportunity to immerse that child in a language. I was giving you the harder situation when a child is reading levels behind in his own language coming from his own country. It's harder for us to get him up in 180 days. Bob, was there something? I just want to <clears throat> make sure that the folks in the audience are informed about two major initiatives that have been put in place the past year and this year and next year, whether or not the UNS, the UNS petition had been initiated, whether or not it had passed, the school system had already planned the introduction of a brand new reading program which was purchased during the past year and for which all of the staff, bilingual staff and special education staff included, were trained in the use of that program this year and the plan for the end of this year and all of next year is to purchase a new math program. And those two initiatives, along with the introduction of longer blocks of time in reading and longer blocks of time in math next year, coupled with hopefully retaining class size comparable to what it is now, if the UNS petition has to be implemented completely and the, uh, the accommodation of waiting a couple of years before it's done in, in full, so to speak, the hope is that the system is still able to get through the next few years of that transition in comparison to what some of us have experienced in past major changes like this where, where there are significant increases in class size, a significant reduction in resources, i.e. textbooks, and a significant reduction in time to train teachers in how to use those new materials. This, this school system has done a good job the last couple of years moving ahead and unfortunately with the UNS petition in place, um, while it could make a major impact, I, I honestly feel that the impact will be a little more accommodating and a little more sustainable in some of all because of the major initiatives in place. So all of our teachers have been trained in the new reading series, all of our teachers will be trained as we choose a new math series, and all of our professional development and class size has helped us to move ahead. And the hope is that if we do have to make these major kinds of changes in terms of transition of students more sooner, if you will, into monolingual classes, that it, it'll be a, a, a little, it won't be smoother, but it'll be a little smoother than if we had not put any of these particular initiatives in place. And so hopefully we're able to accommodate a longer period of time, but if we're not, we do have some major initiatives in place that would have been in place anyway, and now having put them in, hopefully keeps us a little more comfortable in what may have to happen the next couple of years. We've been very efficient. Our money has gone into textbooks, not technology for school committee. Sorry for the time. The reason I wanted to speak first, I wanted to take advantage of having the state rep here and ask a question about the bills before the state house and how we as a school committee could be most effective in influencing you know, I know that Larkin has refiled his bill, and I called his office yesterday, and I just want to know how we as a school committee could be most effective 
in affecting that legislation. The way Larkin's staff explained it to me, he'll refile his bill in the hope that somewhere between what he proposed and passed in the spring of last year and the UNS referendum, there may be some meeting ground. Well, that's our hope, and I think it's very important. We were dis disturbed that Senator Antonioni wasn't a co-sponsor this year. So it mean that to me, that means that we need a lot of support at the State House. When there's the hearing, it would be good if people came. Um, I think the Somerville representatives will probably um, support that bill, but I think it's going to have to be enough people to overcome a governor's veto in both the House and Senate. So if the school committee can contact other school committees, and I think we will try to listen to our school committees. Uh, representatives and senators will listen to school committees. And if any of the parents and the teachers have friends in other communities, it would be very important to speak to, your, to their reps and their senators. Some of the teachers live in other communities. I think uh, Dr. Argenciano is exactly right, that communities that don't have a, a large bilingual population need to hear about the importance for people in Somerville of some kind of stability and some kind, of, what we're phrasing it as is that there needs to be more choice for parents and more choice for communities. So that's why we're going to support the Larkin Bill. And so if you can do anything to get my colleagues to support it more strongly, that would be great. Thank you very much. Pat, before you sit, what about the superintendent's letter? Do you see that that could just on its own pass the legislature even as an interim measure? Because the, certainly a three-year implementation would be very valuable. I was very happy to hear Dr. Agenciano make that announcement. I think that's an important, very important step. And all the points he made were exactly on point. So I assume that this would be a bill filed also. Is that right, Dr. Genziano? So then that would be part of the mix with the Larkin bill. So some, it seems to me what you probably want is this plus Larkin. And if you can get either one of them, that would be good too. But mostly what I think people need to say is we need time, especially if you're going to cut our budgets. We need time to make these adjustments. And kids need time. Um, to make the adjustments. So those, those would be my remarks. Thank you. And I just think the turnout tonight is so impressive. And if other people could see how many people are turning out tonight, when I know a lot of people work more than one job, I think that they would see that your kids' education is important to you. So thank you. At this time, I will invite people from the audience to come forward. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ruby. I've been going to the Unido since kindergarten, and I want to tell you about bilingual education. Bilingual education is very important because the brain fades out at the age of 18 or so. So it's important to learn another language while you're still young. Plus. Plus, if I wasn't learning Spanish, I wouldn't be able to go to El Salvador when I'm older. That's why bilingual education is very important. Gracias. Yes. Hi, my name is Joanna Vasquez, and I'm a student at Malden High School. I'm a member and aspiring drum major of the band, and I'm also bilingual. I speak English and Spanish. Now, I just missed the band rehearsal in Malden to come here because my mother's a teacher here at Somerville and she told me that you were planning on banning the bilingual education. It really hurt me to know this. Um, why is it that American kids are allowed to learn in Spanish while Latino kids are, by law, forced to not be allowed to learn Spanish? Thanks. Hi, I'm Nancy Aviles. I'm in the sixth grade bilingual at the East Somerville Community School. I arrived to the United States on February 2000, um, 22, 2000. I came to, to school here at, as a third grader. I was placed in a bilingual third grader classroom. I didn't know how to speak 
English very well. I'm, it made me feel comfortable to be in the classroom because it, I couldn't understand the teacher. The teachers playing the work we did in class in both Spanish and English. I was able to understand what the teacher was teaching and was learning all of the, the things that other kids were learning also. I went to the fourth grade bilingual. I was able to understand more English than the year before. I learned all about science and social studies in Spanish while I was learning other subjects in English. I spent fifth grade in bilingual Spanish class in Boston. This past summer, my family moved back to Somerville. They put, in, put me in bilingual sixth grade for one more year. Most of this year, I have been preparing for next year when I will be placed out of bilingual. I take math and language art with the sixth grade English teachers. I'm doing pretty well, and I understand the work I am given. My past three years in bilingual classes have helped me be prepared for the content I'm learning and going to learn. They also helped me to con communicate in English with my teacher, my new friends, and the schoolwork. I expect to complete. Please don't take that bilingual away program away. I'm very lucky to know two languages. Other students should be able to have the same opportunities that I had when I came to some of it three years ago. Hi, my name is Christine Henneberry, um, and I feel like I keep talking to this school committee. My daughter is a third grader in the Unidos. Uh, we came to the bilingual program with her knowing no Spanish whatsoever. She is what I consider right now completely bilingual or pretty nearly completely bilingual in Spanish. Certainly much more than I could do. More though, what this program has given to myself and to this community is a chance for children to learn together. Margaret has friends who she would never, ever, ever have met if it hadn't been for Unidos. I have friends I never would have met if it hadn't been for this program. I think what it does is it brings the city together to allow children to study together when they have a different language. And I really, really cannot emphasize enough how important it is that we back this kind of program for our kids. It's not just the children that win, it's the entire community that will win. Thank you. My name is Eloisa Souza, and I am with the Brazilian Women's Group, a community agency based in Somerville, which provides services and information to mostly the Brazilian community, not only in Somerville, but in the Boston greater, um, in the greater Boston area. Um, I am also a parent of two children who attended bilingual education. I have worked with education and bilingual education for about 10 years, and I'm here today to use this, commit, this committee to save bilingual education by supporting the, the Larkin Bill, but also helping parents to put pressure on our legislators so they can overthrow question, question two. Thank you. My name is Jim Kaplan. I'm a teacher in the Somerville Public Schools in the Adult Education Center scale. I speak solely for myself, not for the union that I'm active in. I'm delighted beyond, beyond uh, plausible dreams with the announcement about the UNIDOS program. I think it's wonderful. Uh, it's a very good first step beyond what I thought possible. Um, these, th this is an administrative triumph. It remains for the school committee to move forward on policy areas. There are three suggestions that I want to speak to. One is a vote of support, if it hasn't been taken, I may be behind, on, in support of the Larkin bill as currently drafted. Um, I know the sentiment of the school committee, so I assume it's simply pro forma to go ahead and take that vote to go on record. It does encourage other school committees that might find it a bit more contentious in cities where UNS was not defeated, where it's a bit more difficult. Your vote will encourage other people. For the people in the audience, it's important to know that Representative Jalen here and Representative Champa are both co-sponsors of the Larkin Bill. We have a third representative in representing Somerville, and that is Representative Toomey. 
and people who are constituents of his should consider after this evening how to organize this power in this assembly to bring Senate, uh, Representative Toomey along to support the Larkin bill. The second is about a home rule petition. Now, I, under, I recognize that it's not particularly likely that any home rule petition will in fact be able to pass either house of the, the legislature, much less get a gubernatorial signature. Nonetheless, it shows, such requests do show wellsprings of support for bilingual education that give some sustenance to efforts like those of uh, Representative Larkin. The third item that I'm interested in, and the last that I'm interested in addressing is the PACs. The PACs are the sole vehicle that most immigrant parents have to maintain some communication that is two-way with the Somerville School Department. As the bilingual programs are eliminated, we need to consider mechanisms that maintain the organization and collective presence, not individual single parent uh, communication, but collective communication of the foreign language communities that uh, have children in the Somerville School Department. Despite the declining pr proportion of immigrants in the city of Somerville, the long-term trend in that direction, and despite the short-term blows of this year and next year in the budget, some mechanism needs to be developed to sustain collective organization of the immigrant parents who are here tonight for the future. Thank you very much. Good night. My name is Gloria Salazar, a kindergarten teacher, bilingual teacher in, uh, in the city. I wanted to say that I, I'm a teacher here by choice. I love the city. I am extremely proud of what you do for bilingual children, for minority children. And we gather here tonight to remind you that we trust you and that we uh, bilingual people, minority communities in the city have a face and that our children are here and trusting you uh, to keep the programs going and to do as much as you can to face uh, those horrible laws that have been passed and that can harm a lot of these people sitting with us tonight. Our next speaker will be speaking in Haitian Creole and I'll do my best to translate. Mam komino te l'école la, si pe intendant l'école yo, parents, gardiens, élèves yo, bonsoir. Members of the school committee, superintendent of schools, and parents and guardians of students, good evening. Moirele Yubenta Des. My name is Yubenta Des. Mwena, 9e grade nan Somerville High School. Epi, mwen genye selman 4 mwa, 5 jou de nan peyi isi. I am in the ninth grade. I'm currently in the ninth grade at Somerville High School, and I've only been in this country for about four months and five days. I came to this country because my parents brought me here. When I was coming to this country, my parents told me that I would be attending school. And they told me it was important because when you're in the United States, there are a lot of opportunities for those people who go to school. I was very happy to hear this. Effectivement, as of now, I have been at Somerville High School for the past three months. I began to enjoy the system greatly because they gave us a lot of opportunities to learn a lot. Program I believe the bilingual education program is one of the backbones of Somerville schools. 
Les bails petits immigrants qui payent les taxes avant pour apprendre toute matière. Tant que l'histoire, science, mathématiques, langage, plus que l'ISL, il y anglais. The programs, the program gives the um, children of tax-paying immigrants the opportunity to learn many subjects, including history, science, mathematics, and other language as well as ESL. Ce que fait le programme nous fait pour nous, c'est parce que nous pas apprendre bien. We say that the program does a lot for us because we recognize that we are learning well. Kounyea. Bel rêve nous te gagnons aller. Now our beautiful dream is gone. Nous perd en pile parce que maman a papa nous dit programme ça pour l'éliminer. We are very afraid because our parents have told us that this program has been eliminated. Yo vle éliminer rêve nous pour ne pas vienne citoyen valable. Et puis important dans la société ça. This new referendum stands to ruin our dreams and to keep us from being valuable citizens in society. Pour qui ça? Ces programmes pas nous. Why our program? Tant pis, pas si rêve nous. Please don't let our dreams die. La bon ni pour nous ni pour pays États-Unis parce que éducation c'est bâton petit immigrant et puis c'est clé dans succès yon pays merci um, this program is good not only for the country but for each of us who are learning because education is a weapon of the young immigrants and it's a key to success in this country thank you wanted to respond to this particular question and I want to also acknowledge our interpreter is a Somerville High School student. Okay. Herself the product of bilingual education. Does it work? This particular issue, though, I think is important for the school committee to come out very strongly because the law says that over age 10. Oh, do you want me to translate to the? I think, oh, I'll, yeah. I think in the end, you could give her the gist. I really do, because we have so many speakers. It's important. The UNS amendment as passed gives students, gives parents over the age of 10 the right to request a waiver. As a school committee, we must be very vigilant, very proactive that parents understand this right. That in the law, I'm assuming this is every bit of the UNS law, section three. Oh. Section 4, provision, part 2, says over the age of 10, parents can request a waiver for 20 or more students in a community. We need to provide the program that parents um, are requesting a waiver for. So I think in terms of our high school bilingual programs, under the UNS law, they can continue. And that's the word that we need to get out to make the waiver procedure easy for parents to ask for. UNS has tried to put barriers in the place. You need to come to the school. You need to renew every year. But as a school committee, that's something we can have a role in for September 03 in making sure that every waiver opportunity under this law is available and that parents know it's there. Because our high school programs, everyone that comes to our high school is over the age of 10. And so I don't want the beautiful dream to end and I want someone to be able to learn in 
their native language how to become fully fluent in English. And this is available under the UNS, and this is where I think we can come out and make some um, some ideas tonight about how we can make sure parents know the rights that they do have still under the UNS amendment. Hello, um, my name is Sitsi, Sitsi Delgado, and um, I'm here to talk about two different points. Uh, first, I want I feel more comfortable talking to the, to the audience. Um, I want to talk about my own experience um, as somebody who came from Mexico when I was 13. Um, even though I knew some English before I came t uh, to the U.S., um, my parents decided to put me on the all English classes. And personally, that was a very traumatic experience. Um, I spent about two years of complete isolation, no friends, no one to tutor me. Uh, and then when I moved to Cambridge, I realized that the people who, the students who were in the bilingual uh, program, they seemed to enjoy it more than I did my, my first two years. Uh, so that's one thing that I wanted to talk about. And then the other is, um, I'm here to represent my organization, which is the Latin American Health uh, Institute, El Instituto de Salud Latina. Uh, we work primarily with people who come from Latin America. Some, some of them are born here, uh, but a lot of them uh, don't, don't speak English. And we've done research, not just with our clients, but with other Latin American communities, and we've asked them what are some of the issues that they're concerned about. Um, and one of the things that they always talk about is the lack of people, the lack of um, health workers who speak their language. Uh, and so we advocate not just bilingual education, but by two-way uh, bilingual uh, education, because it, it helps produce um, a workforce that's, that's going to be able to work with all these people who are coming from other countries. Um, and I think learning an another language doesn't just teach you the language, but it also teach you, teaches you a lot about the culture of that, um, the, pe the, the other person. Hi, my name is Freddy Varela. I'm 12 years old. I am in the sixth grade bilingual at Somerville Community School. I came to this school from El Salvador in September of 2000. I was placed in a, a fourth grade bilingual classroom. My teacher spoke and taught in both Spanish and English. She helped me, she helped me learn and write and read much better in Spanish. At the same time, she began teaching me on basic level in English, as I was learning all about the exciting world of Whether in Asian civilization, my first language of Spanish, I was also learning basic grammar, vocabulary, and spelling in English. In the fifth grade, I felt much better about my ability to speak and understand English with my friends and teachers. Although I was getting much better in my understanding of English, some of the things we did in class were in Spanish. I like that because the difficult information of science, social studies, was much easier to understand in Spanish. Now I am in the sixth grade bilingual. This is my third year. I feel very confident to go to into all English class next year. This year I'm preparing for that. I I go to math and social studies with the sixth grade English teachers. Now I understand the information in English much better because of the experience I had in the bilingual classes these past two years. I'm very proud to be able to read, write, and speak in both English and Spanish. I know that this will help me a lot in the future when I will grow up and want to go to college, and later I want to get a job. I hope the bilingual program in Somerville stays because other kids like me deserve the same education I had. Speaking two languages is much better than speaking one. I'm proud to have the privilege. My name is Betsy Reardon. I'm a third grade teacher at the UNIDOS program, and I'd like to speak to the issue of educational excellence. What we're talking about here is the difference between a mildly adequate program and an excellent program. This East, East Somerville Community School has been recognized for its improvement on test scores with bilingual students. We've already proven that this works. 
You just listen to Freddie. Freddie didn't learn that amount of English in 10 months. What he was speaking about was the difference between playground English, the English you learn when you talk to other people, and the English you need to succeed in this world. That's the English of test scores, that's the English of the MCAS, that's the English we want our students to learn. And if they have Spanish or Portuguese or Haitian Creole or Punjabi behind them, and if they have the support of their native language, their learning will be better and, more, and they will understand more deeply what is presented to them. My father was visiting me the other day and my son came home from uh, his, I think it was second or third month at Unido, singing a local song from my father's hometown in Panama. And you should have seen the smile on his face. It was unbelievable. He was practically in tears. He was so happy. Hi, my name is Vanessa Santos, and I am a youth coordinator at MAPS, the same agency that Paulo was just talking about. And I work in Somerville and Cambridge with a lot of Brazilian Portuguese youth, and I also work in the Dorchester, Roxbury area with Cape Verdean youth. And I just want to share the experience that I'm having with the youth today in my office. And we're talking about more than 30 kids that I see every day, not every day, but every month, coming to my office wanting to talk to me or with the youth counselor. They're coming to me today asking me what are we going to do with our bilingual education. Some of the ki these kids are telling me that if they, get, if they have a hard time um, introducing themselves in the, the new program, that they are thinking about giving up school. These are kids, the same kids that are telling me that they want to quit school, are, the, are kids who are getting straight A's in school. Where are they going to go if they quit school? They got, they're probably going to be walking down the streets. And what are they going to be doing? They're probably going to be engaging themselves in risk behaviors, drinking, alcohol, gang, and violence. Is that what we want for our kids? Do you see an inflectuation of special ed students when ANS is put through and these kids can't live up to what they're expected to live up to? We feel that probably the uh, reading related issues uh, will increase towards special education, very definitely. Uh, <laughs> we've used this research before, but 80% of all K-1 SPED referrals are reading related. All four, five, and six, 80% of SPED referrals are socially related to language, and you work yourself all the way up and do research on people incarcerated in prisons, 80% of them have literacy issues. So it starts in kindergarten, it goes all the way up, and we feel that a number of students will be SPED referrals and our SPED numbers will increase because there'll be reading-related literacy issues, very definitely. I have, and I want to distribute to the school committee and the superintendent, budget figures pr prepared by Superintendent Pezant and his staff in Boston that shows that they project that to implement question two, to implement UNS, will cost the city of Boston $16 million more, more, than bilingual ed this coming school year. There's also been a study done statewide that shows that it comes out to about $105 million more statewide. Now I asked Mr. Snow how many LEP English language learner kids we have in Somerville, just guesstimate, and his guesstimate was maybe, maybe 700. If you use the Boston figures, that's about an additional 800, 900,000 more that would have to be cut from the budget in order to place those kids in separate immersion programs. Which leads me to another point. The city of Framingham has asked, and I don't know if you know this, uh, Al, has asked the uh, Division of Local Mandates for a ruling that question two is an unfunded and illegal mandate, particularly on the urban cities. And I would suggest that their reasoning is the same would apply to Somerville, applies to Boston, applies all over this state. So I hope action is taken on the letter that the urban superintendents are sending out to delay this thing. But if not, it strikes me that you're facing a massive unfunded mandate that will only compound the problems you have because you'll have to cut more teachers to meet that unfunded mandate. No one wants to go in that direction. Finally, 
I want to reach two other points and then I'll pass the mic. There's a myth about one year, and we have to put an end to the myth about one year, put an end to it tonight. What the legislation says is that it is intended that it would teach kids English in one year. And there has been a lot of fuss about that during the campaign about question two, because we knew that wasn't true. We knew that in California, kids stayed in that separate, segregated immersion program for four and five years. That's the fact. And when we pinned, when you talked to the people who were running that thing, and you said, you know it's not really one year and out, they said, well, that's what we hope. And we said, well, what happened in California? Well, it didn't work out that way. So let's be real about this. This is not a one year and out program. There are some f folks around this state who say, well, one year and out. It's not going to be one year and out. The kids are going to remain in that immersion program year in and year 